Dear friends, we are all well acquainted with the current updating of history to coincide with the principles of the modern era. Every aspect of society is being reinterpreted through a modern lens. As historical figures are being canceled, iconic figures of our own sacred faith have become targeted. This irrational rage is on display in California with attacks and vicious calumnies against St. Unipero Serra. Also, the slandering of Christopher Columbus has become in vogue with such despicable labels used as genocidal maniac, racist, and worse. Likewise, the saint of our examination tonight has been maliciously characterized as being guilty of anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. Even more disconcerting, not only is his popular statue under threat of removal, but the very city that bears his name has been petitioned with demands for it to be renamed. Our illustrious and noble saint this evening is the holy monarch, Saint Louis IX, King of France. He embodied the qualities of a just ruler who was highly intelligent and immensely virtuous. He was a heroic king and a fierce warrior, but above all, a saint. As he is the only French king to be canonized, he was and is the model of all Catholic monarchs of the medieval era par excellence. Having extensive resources at his disposal and being a man of many blessings and talents, he did not see glory for himself in any ambitious sense. Rather, he had uncommon zeal to live faithfully his religion in service to God for his glory first and foremost. Despite being immersed in worldly affairs due to his reign as king, he never lost sight of the heavenly kingdom that is to come and of obedience to his Lord above. This was the measure by which he lived, where his temporal successes and failures did not diminish his constant devotion and passion for Christ. Because of this, we can see how in his greatest victories or times of suffering, it brought out his virtue to shine most radiantly. St. Louis was born in the year of our Lord, 1214, at Poissy, France, on April 25th in the Diocese of Chartres. His parents, King Louis VIII, nicknamed the Lion, and Queen Blanche had their son baptized there into the Christian faith at the Collegiate Church of Notre Dame. When looking at the totality of St. Louis's life, one cannot overstate the influence his mother had in molding him into a saintly king. It would have been easy for the queen to pass her son to nursemaids, entrusting them to fulfill the typical motherly duties of child raising while she attended to the kingdom's affairs. But truly being a devoted woman of God, she would be Louis's primary caregiver. She oversaw his education by sharing with him her variety of books on arts and French and Latin, entrusting that he had the best tutors and constantly overseeing his education and those of her children who all studied Latin while insisting they learned lessons in Christian morals. She would raise two saints, as both Louis and Isabel, her only surviving daughter, were canonized. The queen instilled deep devotion and piety in her royal son. She famously told young Louis, I love you, my dear son, with all the tenderness a mother is capable, but I would infinitely rather see you fall down dead at my feet than that you should ever commit a mortal sin. St. Louis would often comment to others how strongly these words impacted him. His mother's words were engraved so deeply into his heart that he always abhorred sin more than all other evils. In his zeal and charity, he endeavored to impress upon others this same reverential fear. One day, seeing a man afflicted with leprosy, he asked one of his courtiers whether he would rather suffer this disease or commit a mortal sin. The courtier answered that he would rather have a hundred mortal sins on his soul than leprosy on his body. The holy king was indignant and replied, Truly you do not understand what it means to be in disgrace with the Almighty. Learn that a mortal sin is more to be dreaded than all the evils on earth. St. Louis would inherit the throne at the tender age of 12, after his father died in 1226. He was his parents' fourth child, but the first three died at early ages, making him heir. His coronation ceremony took place on the first Sunday of Advent in 1226 at the cathedral in Reims. Though an adolescent on the verge of attaining a prestigious worldly title, young Louis did not take lightly his coronation. He prepared himself spiritually by making fervent devotions and keeping a vigil. When taking the coronation oath, he trembled as he knew the awesome responsibility to his subjects that await, but especially to God. Hence, he begged the Lord for resolution, light, and strength in order to employ his duties for divine glory, the defense of holy church, and the good of his people. 
His coronation was a tremendous honor that would be one of the most important events of his life. Yet, thinking so highly of where he was born and baptized, he often signed himself in his familial letters and private correspondence as Louis of Poissy. On several occasions, he shared the following sentiment, I think more of the place where I was baptized than of Reims Cathedral where I was crowned. It is a greater thing to be a child of God than to be the ruler of the kingdom. This last I shall lose at death, but the other will be my passport to an everlasting glory. He would not exercise any kingly powers due to his youth until he turned to age 21. Thus, King Blanche would act as regent, while there were a host of advisors who instructed him on the necessary skills of a future monarch. No one would be so influential in his life as his good mother. For his mother's positive role, she would remain a trusted and valued advisor to her son, the king, throughout her life. Even as a youth, modesty was such an important aspect of the king's character that it had a profound effect on others around him. He was fond of music and singing, but never revelry. Thus, it is no surprise that when marriage was opportune, only a highly virtuous lady would suffice. His eventual bride would be Margaret of Provence, renowned for her beauty, wit, and immense piety. While some political connections influenced the arrangement, the young maid's piety was far more of a deciding factor. Their common interests in music and deep allegiance to Christ led to a happy marriage with eleven children. St. Louis would assume full hold of the reins of kingship in 1236 after reaching his 21st birthday. While many men would lose their minds and souls by having such power and treasures at their disposal, this was not the case for King Louis. He remained level-headed, showed respectful deference to his mother, and further developed his spiritual life by praying regularly the hours of the divine office. The first monument he built was the Abbey of Royamont in 1235, which fulfilled a promise to his father, who had ordered in his will that the price of King Louis's jewels would be the founding of a monastery. Not only did St. Louis meet the expectation, but he made the foundation truly stately and majestic. The young king even assisted the building project with his own hands. Four years later, in 1239, he would negotiate with the Latin emperor of Constantinople to secure the crown of thorns. St. Louis and his brother, Robert Count of Artois, would carry the revered relic into Paris, walking barefoot amidst devout and majestic processions. The king would then build the magnificent St. Chapelle for a reception of the holy relic. Numerous accounts testify to the king's piety, with John, Lord of Joinville's biographical work being one of the most popular. He was a member of the king's court, a knight, and later friend who would join him in the Seventh Crusade as a counselor and chronicler. He notes that the king would often hear office hours sung by a full choir, attend one or two masses a day, and attend vespers in Compline at night. Whenever going near an altar to pray, the powerful king was described as appearing more humble and recollected than even the most devout hermit. His generous allowance for several hours in the day for prayer drew criticism from his court. Once, when others remarked that he spent too much time in prayerful devotions, the king replied that if he was engaged in hunting, tournaments, gaming, or plays, they wouldn't have noticed the time he spent on those activities. It should come as no surprise, then, that he banished from his courts all entertainments that were an occasion of sin. Equal to his fear of sin was his genuineness in doing good works and practicing Christian virtues. His limitless generosity to the poor demonstrated his love of Christ— he fed over 100 people daily, even more in Lent and Advent. He washed the feet of poor beggars once a week, often choosing the blind to humbly conceal his identity, also visiting the poor and sick in hospitals. He gave alms constantly to monks, poor widows, and pregnant mothers, to poor workmen who through old age or sickness could not pursue their trade, and opened a house for recovering prostitutes. When criticized for his charity as being excessive, the king replied, Better to be extravagant in almsgiving for the love of God than on vain and worldly show. He fasted frequently, not only on fast days, but all seasons. He observed moderation and abstinence in food and drink. In Lent, he abstained from wine altogether and drank beer instead, which he disliked. Remember, he's French. His good works and mortification were manifested from a deep Eucharistic piety that was truly genuine. In Joan Carroll Cruz's book, Eucharistic Miracles, she shares this account. 
Once during the exposition of the Blessed Sacrament in the chapel in King Louis's residence, the saint was working in his study when a courtier excitedly burst in, exclaiming, Sire, the infant Jesus is appearing in the host upon the altar. The saint calmly continued his writing, quietly replying, I could not believe more firmly in Christ's presence in the Eucharist if I were to behold a miracle. We can also thank St. Louis for his influence on Catholic worship. He would regularly kneel at mention of Christ's incarnation and was seen doing so at Holy Mass in his private chapel. While genuflecting for the incarnation was not a uniform practice at that time in the church, he was the catalyst for it spreading throughout France and eventually the church. Recall this next time you kneel during the Angelus Creed, our last gospel. St. Louis took seriously his mission as lieutenant of God on earth. Being devastated by the news that Jerusalem had fallen again to the Muslims in 1244, he vowed to lead a campaign to come to the aid of Christians in the Holy Land. Because his kingdom was in excellent economic condition, he had more than enough wealth and resources to fund a crusade. St. Louis personally took care in meticulously organizing this campaign to be properly financed, provisioned, and well-planned. The island of Cyprus and the Mediterranean Sea would be the staging point for the crusade where food and supplies would be stockpiled. The French fleet would set sail for Cyprus on August 25th, 1248, arriving in September. There, he informed his troops that they would begin their campaign in Egypt. The prevailing wisdom after the Third Crusade was that whomever wished to control Jerusalem must conquer and control Cairo. His meetings with his war council included evaluating the Fifth Crusade in order to avoid its costly mistakes. The fleet would set sail on Trinity Sunday after eight months preparing in Cyprus, arriving at the North Egyptian port city of Damietta in June 1249. The Sultan of Egypt, al Sali was awaiting them on an opposite river bank to prevent their landing and entering the city. Seeing the Saracens, the king proclaimed, who am I but a wretched man whose life belongs to God? He has a sovereign right to dispose of it as it pleases him. Whether we are conquerors or martyrs, we shall glorify him either by the prosperity of our arms or by the sacrifice of our lives. The French galley ships had the ability to open on the beach, allowing for the knights to have easy access into ground battle. This advantage proved too much for the Muslim forces, and the crusaders gained the upper hand quickly and would take the port city immediately after its local garrison retreated. The Muslim sultan would lead his forces further south along the river to reestablish position at the fortified town of Mansura. After the victory, King Louis made his entrance into the city of Damiata, humbly walking barefoot with the queen, his brothers, and lords. He would give thanks to the triune God by entering the principal mosque of the city where his papal legate purified and consecrated it, dedicating it under the name of the Mother of God. In late November, he would direct his army towards Cairo, setting up bases along the way to avoid the critical mishap that occurred in the Fifth Crusade, being disconnected from the coast. The decisive victory at Damietta gave the impression of inevitable future victories and positive results. Agreeing with the view of his brother, Robert Count of Artois, but against the prevailing advice of his war council, Louis decided to push immediately to Cairo instead of securing port cities. The brothers both thought action at Cairo was urgently needed and that it couldn't wait several months required for other strategies. On November 20th, the king and his troops began their trek along the Nile River towards Cairo and would arrive at the town of Mansura after a month of marching. They set up base camp along the Nile in an adjoining tributary, making preparations for their siege of the city. The initial force across the river was led by the king's brother, Robert, along with Templars, Hospitallers, and an English contingent of horsemen. Not following orders by waiting for the rest of the army to secure its position, the advancing forces immediately launched an attack against the Muslim warriors. This surprise caught them off guard, and the Muslim general was slain. Spurred by this good fortune, Robert rashly pressed onward, driving the backpedaling troops into the town confines itself. The Muslim counterattack would regain its footing, and the Crusader army would find the narrow streets of Mansura to significantly handicap their cavalry. Count Robert would be killed and his unit virtually obliterated. After King Louis and his cavalry made the ford crossing, they viewed the horrifying sight that their leading force had been demolished. Hemmed in by the Nile and facing fierce and confident advancing foes, the Crusaders tried to withstand the onslaught until reserves arrived. Fighting with much bravery and determination, the king's army held their ground to the end of the day. 
Lord John of Joinville provided a vivid description of King Louis in the battle outside Mansura, following the deaths of Robert of Artois and the Templars. While I was on foot with my knights, wounded, up came the king with his own division. There was a great shouting and a tremendous noise of trumpets and kettle drums. He halted on a raised roadway. Never have I seen so fine a man in arms. He towered head and shoulders over his people, a gilded helmet on his head, and in his hand a sword of German steel. When he had halted there, the good knights of his household, with some of the brave knights of the king's division, hurled themselves into the midst of the Turks. You must know that this was a great feat of arms, for there was no shooting of arrows nor bolts. On both sides it was a fight with mace and sword and a mixed mass of our men and the Turks. However, the damage was done, and the crusader numbers were so diminished that conquering Cairo became impossible. Adding further hardship, severe illness pervaded the Christian camp, along with their supply lines to Damietta, being severed by the newly arrived sultan. This very problem of the Fifth Crusade was what King Louis and his advisors had tried to avoid, yet they were in a much worse spot. The crusaders attempted to retreat back north along the Nile, but it was made difficult by their deteriorating health. Rampant scurvy caused men to lose gums and jaws amid other horrors, yet the saint obliged his army to stay strong and observant of Lent. The sultan and his army would eventually meet the crusaders, slaughtering the poorest of health and most wounded while capturing King Louis and his knights. Under captivity, the king was treated with respect as his conduct and demeanor filled the Muslims with esteem. Amid his illness and disasters, the king never uttered a word of impatience or anger. With his chaplains in his company, he continued daily recitation of the breviary and had holy mass read to him. When he was threatened by guards with an instrument of torture, he replied calmly that they were masters of his body and they could do as they wished. The king was resolute amidst this and other threats, regularly changing the enemy's hatred to admiration. It is said that even some of the emirs viewed him worthy of the honor of sultan, were he not an enemy of their religion. After a substantial ransom was raised, the king was released in May of 1250. He and the remaining portion of his army would sail to Agar on the coast of modern-day Israel. There they served assistance to Christians in Palestine for the next four years. He fortified much of the surrounding area, serving as a de facto ruler of the region. With a zeal of a missionary, he also strengthened Christians in their faith, making his period in the Holy Land region fruitful. He left behind a French garrison in Acre and would return to France in 1254. While the crusade was, by historical accounts, disastrous, he gained trust in the Latin kingdoms and would still be admired by Christians in Europe for his worthy goals. The king would again launch another crusade in response to Muslim conquests in the east. This effort would be much better financed and provisioned than his last one. Sadly, it ended before it barely began. After one successful battle outside of Carthage in 1270, disease broke out in the camp with dysentery rampant. King Louis became deathly ill himself, and after receiving last rites, cried out, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. The saintly king died on August 25th, 1270. The crusaders were crestfallen. All of Christendom mourned his loss. Before leaving Paris, the king had penned a lengthy letter to his son regarding temporal and spiritual advice. He read it to his eldest son, Philip, while on his deathbed. Here's an excerpt. My dear son, before all things, I would teach you to set your heart to love God. For unless he love God, none can be saved. Keep yourself from doing what is displeasing to God, that is to say, from mortal sin. You should be willing to suffer every manner of torment rather than commit a mortal sin. If God sends you adversity, accept it patiently and give thanks to our Savior and think that you have deserved it and that he will make it turn to your advantage. If he sends you prosperity, thank him humbly so that you don't become worse from pride or any other cause when you ought to be better. For we should not fight against God with his own gifts. When St. Louis initially received full power as monarch, he was determined to make France one of the foremost Christian kingdoms. He ruled over a golden age of France, when it was a leading force in Europe and protector of the Catholic Church. France was at the height of economic, military, and social power. However, modern historians and political activists take issue with some of his laws and actions. In 1230, he outlawed all forms of usury and kept Jewish subjects from practicing it. 
He later forced him to repay what had been earned through that practice. Because he had no tolerance for blasphemy, he passed a law that punished offenders by branding their lips. He also ordered the burning of thousands of manuscript copies of the Talmud following the disputation of Paris of 1240. This was following debates and examinations of blasphemous statements in the Talmud about Jesus and Mary. While we don't have time to fully examine this topic, his actions toward the Jewish people should be viewed in the light of the historical context in which he lived. It is incorrect to label the king an anti-Semite, since that modern term indicates racial connotations and not religious motivations. St. Louis's actions were those of one trying to preserve the Christian faith in his kingdom and should not be scrutinized through a politicized racial theory. As agnostic biographer Jacques Lagoff notes, the king's actions should be considered at best anti-Jewish. Again, this would be describing a religious sense, which is still more than some modern minds can handle, to hear of one religion being valued over another. These events should in no way tarnish the legacy of the great king. The legal system in France was greatly improved under his reign as the king abolished the medieval practice of trial by ordeal and implemented the Roman principle of innocent until proven guilty. He encouraged and supported religious orders throughout his kingdom and had many sacred relics brought from Israel to France for veneration. He was a patron of the sacred arts, especially Gothic architecture. Saint-Chapelle in Paris remains one of the most beautiful examples of Gothic architecture in existence and was an engineering marvel at the time of its building. By and large, his reign was peaceful, and under his leadership, he resolved several territorial disputes from leading to war. He funded the building of hospitals, churches, cathedrals, and monasteries, and gave tirelessly to the poor. Whenever he would give time to personally adjudicate legal cases, he would give deference to the poor, because the rich always had plenty of people for their defense. The Oxford Illustrated History of Medieval Europe, not known for being Catholic-friendly, cites St. Louis for his, quote, intense devotional piety, a concern for justice and peace, his reputation as a crusader and exponent of the sanctity of kingship, end quote. Even an anti-Catholic revolutionary like Voltaire recognized the king's virtue. He writes, Louis IX appeared to be a prince destined to reform Europe, if she could have been reformed, to render France triumphant and civilized, and to be in all things a pattern for men. His piety, which was that of an anchorite, did not deprive him of any kingly virtue. A profound policy was combined with strict justice, and he is perhaps the only sovereign who is entitled to this praise. Prudent and firm in counsel, intrepid without rashness in his wars, he was as compassionate as if he had always been unhappy. No man could have carried virtue further. The gospel proper for August 25th, our saint's feast day, is the parable of the talents. The lesson our Lord teaches corresponds to St. Louis's life perfectly, not so much that he shared his earthly wealth with others, but that the Lord's divine grace and love given him was poured out, diffused throughout his life. His investment was obedience to the will of God regardless of the circumstances. The primary goal was not to be consumed with temporal honors and rewards. Rather, being a truly virtuous man, his concern was for the heavenly reward in the next life. St. Louis IX, King of France, pray for us.